friends to worship on this, uh, well, not a beautiful day, but it's a nice day, a spring day here in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to you who are joining us uh, live here in person, and those of you joining us live online, and maybe some of you joining us later in the week. Welcome to all. We are all brought together in this wonderful, with this uh, wonderful medium called technology that allows us to join in worship. So, so welcome, and uh, this Easter season, this is the Easter season until Pentecost, so we have uh, themes of Easter going all the way through until, until uh, uh, Pentecost. So, uh, are the words up on screen on the next slide, Malone? There we are. Friends, Christ is risen. There you go. Hallelujah. There you go. Okay. Uh, are you making an announcement, Donna? Okay, come on up. Oh, okay. Next one. There we go. Good morning. Some of you may have been on the United Church of Canada's website um, since you received the news on Thursday. And if you were, you saw this image, which really spoke to my heart. Um, holding of hands. If you were on that website, you would have read that the establishing of an autonomous national indigenous organization has indeed passed. Um, yeah. <laughs> All our hard work, yeah. The National Indigenous Council, 16 regional councils, and 80% of pastoral charges in the United Church of Canada participated in the vote on the remit. In response, which is why I wanted to have that slide up while I was reading it, this is the response from the National Indigenous Council on the remit for the establishment of an autonomous national indigenous organization. We, the National Indigenous Council, are a diverse group of indigenous peoples 
rooted in distinct innate values and wisdom. We carry a common vision and dream. Respect everyone's story. Care for one another. Uphold community. Build positive relationships. We thank our ancestors and all our relations who have brought us to this very moment. Thank you. This is a huge step towards reconciliation. For those of us that wonder, when will it end? It probably won't. The work of right relations continues as we continue to understand better the harms that we caused and also undo the systems and the structures that have reinforced colonialism in our church. Uh, I hear people talk about um, colonial in our church, come on, but we do. We do have structures of colonialism and the way decisions got made at the national church level were colonial and they needed to evolve. So I'm grateful to all of you for all the feedback you gave. And I think it was largely, I seem to recall Bev uh, relaying a lot of uh, comments that might have been coming in from people in the congregation. We really did want to hear your viewpoint. And, uh, and our council, thank you, United Church Council St. Andrews, for voting, getting our vote in on time so that we registered our feelings as well. So. Hallelujah. Um, we are in a new, new chapter of the work of Towards Reconciliation. Now, if we can go to the previous slide, Malone. I've been out of order here. Uh, so, I'm here to announce today that next week we have our annual general meetings for both uh, St. Andrew's Place and St. Andrew's United Church. It will be held after a shortened worship service uh, right after the worship, there will be a Zoom, a Zoom meeting. So those of you who can't come in person, um, you are welcome to join. You will get the Zoom link in the news. Uh, please have that handy. And so after the live stream of our worship service, have that uh, link handy so you can join in and have your voice heard in the process of our annual general meetings. Not just one meeting, but it's the two meetings of the two bodies that we are responsible for as a congregation, both the church and the place. So thank you to all of you who have been involved in, in preparing for this, the technology people, Scott and Ralph, who have been coordinating this. Thank you for all the time and energy. Please, please, please make a point of, of coming out and participating. Come and, and listen in. Uh, and if you do have some feelings, this is the time. This is the most powerful meeting of the entire year. Council, church council can make all their decisions, but I'll tell you, that has no comparison to the authority of you, the congregation, on a Sunday at an annual meeting. So please come out and know that we are bringing our faith and our ideas and our our dreams and visions, and also our reflections on this past year. We're bringing them to this meeting. So after church, so it'll probably be about 11.45, uh, 12 o'clock, that we begin the, um, the annual meetings. So uh, please join us in person or online. Bev is back. We are so glad you spent time with your sister, sisters, and, uh, and so now rested, uh, Bev graciously invites you to, uh, worship, to the uh, fellowship, to the social hour on Zoom at seven o'clock on Sunday and for successive Sundays as we go into uh, the season of Easter. If you don't have a Zoom link, please ask Bev here or uh, look for her email in the credits and she will send you, gladly send you a, a Zoom link. And that goes for any kind of contact. Please reach out to us. Um, all of our contacts on Facebook, uh, by phone, 
by email. They're all in the credits. Please reach out to us. Let us know how we can help or let us know uh, maybe if you've got an idea of something you'd like to do. Um, I'm glad to entertain that and relay it to the leadership. So please join us in ministry in this church and thank you for all that you do. The wick of a candle is lit and its light of hope and transformation is before us. How amazing that a single beam of light can change our way of experiencing life. May we rest in the glow of Christ's love, ever radiating sparks of peace and new dawn. give thanks for the wonder and diversity of this ecosystem that we live in on earth that we call creation. Every unique element has its place. Flowers, trees, animals, mountains, water, creatures like us, humans. As we take this sacred moment to ponder how awe-inspiring our world is, may we commit ourselves to mirroring that wonder in our work to welcome, to open ourselves to being God's diverse community, where this church's life is space for people to gather, radical hospitality to uh, diversity of race, creed, age, cultural background, sexual orientation, neurodivergence. We give thanks for our diversity that God has created. Since time immemorial, indigenous peoples have occupied and cared for this land throughout the millennia, this place that we call Canada from coast to coast to coast. In naming this landmass, even more specifically, naming Sudbury and the surrounding communities, we acknowledge that we are actually also on the traditional territory and homes of the Wanapetabing First Nation and the Atikamikshing Anishinaabek. As a community of faith, we seek to rebuild right relations with the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples to learn from each other and to live on this land with respect and gratitude for creation and its creator. This acknowledgement is our, our commitment. Children of the Creator, in this place, followers of Jesus, from all around the world, people of the Spirit, living Christ's call, forgive seventy times seven. Uh, Jesus said, in prayer, in action, in love. Now, always, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you pray with me? God of light and life, we gather as witnesses to your abundant love. We are amazed to discover you anew through our prayers, through our praise, and our offerings. 
God, you encourage us amidst our daily living to become stewards of your love and grace. We ask you to be here with us as we witness your love made real through Jesus, whom we call Christ. We pray now together with the more contemporary translation of the prayer that Jesus taught, which is on the screen. Eternal Eternal Spirit, Spirit, bird maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, Strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Can you get that, Francis? Who wrote that? Who just wrote that? I wrote that. How do you know I wrote this? You saw me do that. There you go. You're good kids. You're smart. Very smart. I'm impressed. Well, so... You witnessed what I did. You saw, just like a witness on a stand, you saw what I did. You saw me writing down, I love Jesus. And I do. I do love Jesus, just for sure. So Jesus, in the story today that we're going to hear, thanks to uh, Dan and Allison today, uh, he appears to his disciples after his death. And he tells his friends, you now need to go tell other people because you have witnessed this. I am alive. I'm not a ghost. You can touch me. And you're going to hear that. Because you can imagine there's a bit of disbelief in the witnessing, right? They saw him die on a cross. So seeing him on the other side is really quite baffling. And I'm sure they're going through a lot of grief. So he says, you can touch me. I am not a ghost. So we ask the question today in this service, what does it mean to be a witness? Jesus sent them out in the story, but he sends us out too. I'm imagining the kids sitting beside me, but you, the children of God, going out from here, We are witnesses. He wants us to be a witness to who he is and what he did. So, I have these funky glasses. And because kids are not here, I think I'm going to save one for 
uh, Roger. Little Roger, because I think he deserves one. I think he deserves a nice, fancy brown one. Who would like, I have three glasses. Who would like these witness glasses to go into the world and see through new lenses? Put up your hand. There's one. That's what I like to see. Another one. Anyone? Oh, right on. There we go. Glasses and, oh, okay. Okay. So we are witnesses. And Gloria, I have these for Roger, okay? So those are reserved for him. So we are witnesses. And what does it mean to witness? Not just telling the story, but living the story. To hate, we respond with love. We treat our neighbors the way we would want to be treated. God loves us. We are witnesses. So we tell people about God by loving people the way God loves us. This is a repeat after me prayer. This is a repeat after me prayer. Help us to see the world as Jesus did. Help us to see the world as Jesus did. To love people. To love people. Even when sometimes others don't love. Even when sometimes others don't love. To be kind. To be kind. Even in times when others are not kind. Even in times when others are not kind. To see the wonderfulness in others. To see the wonderfulness in others. Even when that person might not see how wonderful they are. Even when that person may not see how wonderful they are. Amen. 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 Morning. The first reading is from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 16, and chapter 19. The stories in this book of the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles, is a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, taking us with the disciples as they lead the Jesus movement after his crucifixion and resurrection. Peter, who was not always a quick learner in Luke's Gospel, who was not always a quick learner in Luke's Gospel, here exudes inspiration. Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by his own power or piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus. This is the one you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. You rejected the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, the very one whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. His name itself has made uh, this man strong. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Uh, the next reading is a paraphrase based on Luke's gospel story in chapter 24, Learning to Believe. Two disciples of Jesus speaking shortly after the crucifixion. Did you hear the news? What news? That our beloved Jesus died? Yeah, I, I've been so sad. I can't even, I can't think, I can hardly eat. That's just it, we've seen him. What are you talking about? Seriously, listen, we were all gathered talking together and a voice we didn't recognize says, peace be with you. Only it was just like he did and it didn't look like him. We were afraid, we thought a ghost was among us. This is unbelievable, seriously. I don't believe you, what you're saying. I'm telling you, then the ghost uh, man asked why we were afraid, why we had doubt in our hearts. He told us uh, to look at his hands and his feet and even invite us to touch him. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. You're right, of course. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones. 
Yes, so I stepped forward cautiously, mind you. What did I see? His hands, his hands, and his feet. It was him. Amazed, we crowded around. I mean, what can I tell you? Was it really him, truly? Dare I believe? Yes, it absolutely was. And you know, he wanted something to eat. So we gave, uh, we gave broiled fish and he ate it. It reminded me of so many meals we shared with him. I wish I'd have been there. Did he tell you what to do? Would he stay? What's next? He said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so much made sense to us. It was like our minds were open. Oh, you're blowing my mind. I wish I'd been there. Hearing your story makes me feel like I was there. I feel it inside. I believe you. Oh, there's more. Then he said, it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins are to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I cannot wait to tell the others. Me too. I'm telling everyone I know. Let us pray. God of word and wisdom, the risen Christ opened the minds of his friends to understand the scriptures. Send us your Holy Spirit to open the minds, our minds to understand your sometimes baffling truth and love which can fill our hearts and change our lives. Amen. Thank you, Dan and Allison. our baffled disciples this morning. Jesus enfleshed in faith, enfleshed faith. So I think that this is a truth of life. In times of grief, touch is important for many people. I think that we can say it's true if it's a dear friend, a family member coming by in a time of loss, maybe holding a hand or touching your back gently, sitting beside you, giving you a hug, whatever those gestures are that are, uh, are enjoyed within your family or your circle. Or how about just being there silently, showing up to be a support? Maybe words can't really grasp what the feeling of the moment is. I'm thinking back to COVID time. That was so long ago, wasn't it? COVID. We felt the absence of touch and contact so powerfully. And it seems that the lack of connection for that extended amount of time, it was a long time. The inability to touch one another, especially those that we loved, that we had to stay in isolated bubbles, to even visit with one another. I think a lot of us still, even today, are left feeling some of that isolation and we're still healing from it. Imagine if, for a moment, the Gospels had not told the stories of Jesus visiting friends and disciples after his death. Yes, those were powerful stories before his death, the stories uh, uh, of healings and teachings. Those were powerful, but I don't know if they compare to the stories after Jesus' death and resurrection, showing up with great, uh, to the great surprise and disbelief of the disciples. In their disbelief, Jesus says to them, I am no ghost, touch, see perhaps sensing that they still were in somewhat of a psychological bubble of grief. And so he asks them, he, he goes to plan B and says, do you have some food? And, and he says, here, let's eat together. You see, in ancient times, there was a discussion about ghosts and how to determine if a, go a person was a ghost or not. The ability to eat, apparently, was proof that a person was no ghost in the time of Jesus. Good to know, right? If you need to prove you're not a ghost. Now hang on to that little nugget uh, until a time comes up when you might need that. Or a fun fact to share with somebody. 
that enfleshed quality of Jesus was hard and still is difficult for some Christians, ancient and modern alike, to grasp. There were Christian councils set up because some Christian leaders believed that Jesus was not really human. He was actually superhuman, more supernatural. Christianity has always concluded in those debates uh, with an affirmation that Jesus, mysterious as he was, divine as he was, he was indeed flesh and blood, human. But even today, I tell you, my friends, some elements of our Christian community flirt with the idea that Jesus was above humanity. He actually was more powerful. That humanity is evil and impure, and only spiritual stuff that's non, non-fleshy is, is the, the divine and the pure. Dualism is what I think the word used to describe the opposites, people in either or instead of both and camp. But remember the opening of John's gospel. God's word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Now, that's a, that's a message translation. But the idea that God took the form of human flesh. God entered into the messy reality, the fleshy reality of you and me, lived, loved, and died. Unbelievable, isn't it, at one level? Like if, if we weren't here today and we hadn't heard these stories, some of us over and over again for many years, we'd be in a bit of disbelief about this story, that God would take a human form. And it was to those disciples grieving after Jesus' death. Yes, they had heard the rumors of an empty tomb. They'd heard about the angelic guards at the tomb saying that Jesus was alive. But you know and I know that when we are grieving, we have trouble understanding the reality around us. And sometimes we go into a bubble, don't we? I've been in those moments and I can bet that all of you have had a moment like that somewhere in your life. Those disciples were in that bubble, we can be sure. But Jesus met them where they are. Just as the angelic figure offered the words of peace to the visitors at the empty tomb, Jesus now, first words in the scripture that actually was for today, Jesus offers them peace, those disciples. He shows up. I don't know if you remember last week's uh, message, but I was referring to Franciscan priest Richard Rohr and his discussion about the process of spiritual maturity, which I quite like. So it starts with the cleaning up and growing up stages. So psychologically, we mature. Um, And then we wake up spiritually. And I like that discussion about being part of an interdependent world. We are not at the center of God's world. We are part of an interdependent world, each of us equal and important. We are to be interdependent. We are not to control or manage. We are to connect and love and care. Then the big part, the pièce de résistance, the showing up stage to live in the world with all its mystery and all its pain, all its messiness. Our world is messy. We can be sure of that. But we in this world are created to love, we are told, and created to share that love, which implies also receiving love, giving and receiving. There's a lot of grief in our world today A great deal of death and destruction. I just turned on the news this morning. And success seems to be uh, violent responses to violent uh, initiatives. It seems like that's where the world is going. Tyrants and narcissists creating chaos. All depicted on 24-hour news stations so that we could watch it all night if we wanted to sit transfixed. It is traumatizing just like COVID was. We don't even live in a place being bombed or involved in social media being bullied, yet 
we do feel profound grief, not just about our own reality, but looking at the world's reality. I learned of this past week of this wonderful short Mary Oliver poem entitled Evidence, and it goes like this. We shake with joy, we shake with grief. What a time they have, these two housed as they are in the same body. Joy, grief, woven together. We cannot share joy of life until we also share the grief. They are housed in the same body, as Oliver says. Divinity does not exist for us without our embodied reality. I've heard many times a brand of Christianity that relegates flesh to evil and to sin. And you know what? I don't buy it for a second. I think that we are created to be beautiful and holy and to share and love. I don't think God thought that, and I don't think Jesus thinks that. Our gospel story hinges on the very reality that God loved the world so much that God poured out all of God's self into humanity. God became enfleshed and moved into our neighborhood, died enfleshed as well. God's punchline, of course, after the religious and the political bullies thought they had finished Jesus off, Jesus returned to eat with his grieving friends. Only then were their eyes and their hearts opened. Only after their grief, only after touching the wounds, did they experience the joy of resurrection. So where do we need to show up in our lives this coming week, to enflesh Christ for someone this coming week, or perhaps to enflesh God's love for a cause that has been, uh, that we have been grieving for, for days. Maybe it's time to enter into the messiness of life in some small way. Visit, talk on the phone with somebody, contribute your time, your treasures, to a cause that is near and dear to you or to me. Jesus would not have been Jesus without his fleshy part. Agreed? I hope so. Neither are we. Let us enflesh the love of Christ, the love of God for one another. Let us enflesh our faith. Not escape it. Let us be in who we are and be with one another in grief and in joy. Amen.
Minute for Right Relations. Early on it, the first day of the week, Strong Tears, Mary, from Tower of Creators High Lodge, Magdala, came to the burial cave early in the morning while it was still dark. When she saw the stone had been removed from the burial cave, she ran to find stands on the rock, Peter, and he shows goodwill, John, the much-loved uh, follower of Creator Sets Free, Jesus. In 2021, a group of Indigenous cler cler clergy, scholars, church leaders, and members published a new translation of the New Testament called the FNV, or First Nations Version. The group consists of individuals from a range of denominations and Indigenous nations in both Canada and the United States. As the quotation above from the Gospel of John reveals, the FNV is not a literal translation of the New Testament, but a thought-for-thought -thought translation, sometimes referred to as dynamic equivalence, as the Indigenous group explains in an introduction to the text. They make an effort to write with a storytelling cadence, familiar to Indigenous readers. Throughout the translation, insertions may be found that help eludicate the text, such as by the bracketed inclusion of more familiar uh, biblical names but also to provide contextualized information for Indigenous readers, such as may be found in other Bible translations that employ headings, footnotes, and marginal notes to aid the reader. There's even a brief summary of the Old Testament written in similar style to the main translation, which is included as a prologue. Importantly, the authors emphasize that the FNV is not only commended to the use uh, of, the indig of Indigenous Christians, but to all members of the Christian community who they hope will find the FNV insightful and enlightening to their own study of Holy Scripture. I'm going to read that passage from First Nations Bible again because it's, it's remarkable, actually. And uh, I think somehow I'm going to put that in the Facebook page, this story. So if you want to uh, find it and share it. Um, but it's also in, this is also in the, uh, the news, the script that came out for, the, for the, uh, the liturgy for this Sunday. So if you go back to what Allison sent out to you, you'll find the text of this. But, but here it is to listen to. Um, early on the first day of the week, strong tears, and then that's uh, their name for Mary, uh, from Tower of Creators High Lodge, and that's a word for Magdala, came to the burial cave early in the morning while it was still dark. When she saw the stone had been removed from the burial cave, she ran to find Stands on the Rock, and that's their name for Peter, Stands on the Rock. So she ran to Peter, and he shows goodwill, John, uh, what the much-loved follower of, and the word for Jesus, is creator sets free. I love these words. So um, I hope some of us will buy this Bible, purchase it. But I want to say, I use this as a segue into inviting us to offering. Uh, when we think, gee, I'm going to give to St. Andrews, give some of my treasures uh, to St. Andrews, but not to the larger church because they have all kinds of administration or whatever. This is the kind of work that the United Church does all the time, partnering with groups to create new resources that are meaningful and that can help someone like me, a non-Indigenous person, to understand the story as it's understood in other traditions. I am so thankful to Mission and Service for that work. So we're thankful for St. Andrew's United Church and the work we do locally. Thank you for your gifts. But thank you also for your gifts to Mission and Service, which is the United Church arm that reaches out and even is partnering this very day with people in Ukraine and people in Gaza to uh, partners there to help work on, on the rebuilding. Our church is doing amazing stuff. You are doing amazing stuff through everything you give to uh, the larger church. You are part of that work. Thank you also to you who are volunteers. That treasure is the greatest treasure of all for you showing up. Thank you. Thank you for all your gifts. 
Let's bring our offerings forward. for this prayer are responsive, so your words are on the screen. O oh God, we meet you in worship. You bless our offerings for prayer and grace. O oh God, we meet you in the needs of those suffering among us in our local community. You bless our offerings for pastoral care. O oh God, we meet you in the work of education and in providing resources to people across Canada and around the world through mission and service. You bless our offerings for people whose names we will never know. Our offerings are effective when our money is used carefully and faithfully. You bless all our gifts, loving God. Thank you. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Betty. Thank you to those of you who offered prayers, uh, prayer requests in the sheet that's always at the, at the front there. If you have one, you didn't have a chance to either donate or uh, to write your, the name on the, on the sheet of people, the situations to pray for, please feel free to come up here and add it. And uh, just know that the offering plate is always at the door for whenever you feel like you might like to offer a gift um, whether you feel it's large or small, I always say, if it comes from your heart, it's the biggest gift of all. Let us pray. God, we give thanks for your steadfast love, your abiding presence, and your creative counsel and guideposts along the way. You enrich our lives with a world filled with color, scents, and tastes that delight our senses. We see the goodness that surrounds us and give you thanks and praise. We are witnesses to the world in which we live and we see injustices and colossal failures. Sometimes we close our eyes and wish we could unsee some of what we've witnessed. Witnessing has its own form of pain, but the true suffering we see is incomprehensible. We pray for those in daily pain, whose bodies and spirits require great effort. We pray for those who are hungry for food, for encouragement, for relationship. We pray for those whose spirits are diminished. Restore each of these into your attentive care. What some lack, others have in abundance. Guide us to know what is ours to keep and what is ours to share. We pray for our leaders near and far, political leaders carrying the burden of making weighty decisions. Grant them wisdom in their work. For institutional leaders, including our various faith communities, Christianity, Islam as Ramadan winds down, and we give thanks and celebrate the arrival of Eid as they have taken stock of what they've learned from fasting. We hold up Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, and of course, indigenous spirituality near and far. Grant our communities peace in our hearts so that we can share a message of peace and reconciliation in our neighborhoods. We pray particularly for Coppercliffe United Church, which is on our uh, Canadian Shield Regional Council prayer cycle. We pray for our world, our community nearby, here in Sudbury, or where those in other places are praying, 
and situations around the world of great concern. We name those situations out loud. Uh, right now, situations of concern in our world. Name them out loudly if you have one that's weighing heavily on your hearts. Iran, Russia, yes. Australia, after the shooting. Myanmar, still gripped in war and refugees flowing across the border. But I'm also saying to you, God, thank you for Thailand, who are saying loudly, we have places for you to come as long as you lay down your weapons. What a world we live in. We pray for particular people in the silence of our hearts now, people whose circumstances weigh heavily on you and on me, situations that we know that uh, we are aware of. Now let us in silence and in the, in the quiet of our hearts, let us share the weight and the worry with our God in this prayerful moment. God, help us to loosen our grip on belongings and possessions and awaken our hearts so that we may live with hearts attuned to the rhythms and needs of our community and our world. May we live from this moment. May we seek to truly love from this moment. And may we try to live this day as a gift and move into the days ahead with gratitude and generosity. Thank you, God. Thank you. Amen. And I want to say a special uh, hello and welcome to Freddie online. Uh, wonderful to see your name in the comments section and wonderful to always see when I just glance at it, uh, the conversation going on on YouTube. Thank you for joining us wherever you're joining us from. Let's join our voices in our final hymn.
now we prepare to leave this sacred space to go into the sacred space of our world, a world that needs us to enflesh <coughs> God's love for them. Let us go now to be God's children in the world. Open our minds to understand the needs around us. Let us go now to be Christ's servants in the world. Opening our hands to share our blessings with all. Let us go now to be Spirit's hope for the world. Opening our hearts to welcome those who have no one to care for them. 